Hey everybody, thanks for listening. This is episode 16 of the Fierce Fiduciary Podcast. I'm Brian Beasley and with me is Dan Albers. Good morning, Dan. Good morning. It's been a while since we've had some questions from the wild. And we discussed just doing that today for as the focus of our podcast. So we have a handful of them this morning to talk about. So what do we have? Well, first question, I have multiple accounts at various brokerage firms slash platforms. Should I condense them into one brokerage? So this is a pretty common question. We see this a lot. We see people who either over time do this accidentally where they open an account here, they open an account there and they, they think in their minds, they're opening an account for one purpose and they have an account for stocks and they have an account for mutual funds and they have an account for their long term or whatever, whatever in their mind, their mental accounting is I'm going to have an account here and here and here and here. And at some point they end up realizing they really don't have a cohesive portfolio. They just have a collection of things. They have a kind of a mess. And I don't know if that's this person's situation, but you know, back to our eight guidelines, I would say that generally I, w- I would default to simple and effective. If you have an account, I mean, granted, if you have a 401k account at work, it needs to stay in the 401k as long as you're working there. But if you have other investment accounts like an IRA, a Roth IRA, an individual investment account, or if you have three investment accounts, one with mutual funds, one with ETFs, and one with one with individual stocks, you do not have to have all those in different places. You know, one at one firm, one at another, et cetera, et cetera. Most of the big brokerage firms allow you to do it all in one place. So, for example, one of the custodians we use at our company is Charles Schwab. And in a Charles Schwab investment account, or a Charles Schwab IRA account, or a Charles Schwab Roth IRA account, inside of those accounts, you can invest in stocks, CDs, bonds, individual mutual funds, exchange traded funds. You can even buy some alternative investments like non-traded real estate investment trusts. I mean, it's really almost anything you can imagine can be inside that one account at Charles Schwab, at Fidelity, at TD Ameritrade, any big, huge brokerage firm. Um, They have a huge, huge menu of options, and there's no reason for you to to have your money all over different firms. That just doesn't make sense to me. That's just an added piece of complexity that almost makes it impossible for, for you to have perspective on what's going on. You're, you're completely siloed and it's just not effective in the long run. So I would, I would absolutely suggest looking to condense them into one brokerage and and this, and the same similar in the similar vein, we sometimes see people where they have two or more quote financial advisors in the, in the idea there sometimes is I'm going to diversify my advice and this person's managing this part of my finances and they only know about that part of my finances. And then over here, I have someone who's managing this other part of my finances. And and usually when that happens, you have no cohesive plan. You don't have a coordinated effort. Yeah. In the best of times, you might have two advisors that are cordial with each other if they're aware of one another, but they don't have an, an active understanding of what's happening in each other's worlds and in each other's accounts. And so how can either of those advisors provide their best advice to the client somewhere there's going to be waste and somewhere there's going to be redundancy if you have two or more quote financial advisors if you have a financial advisory team if you want to diversify the ideas don't hire one human hire a team that works collaboratively or find a find a a situation where you have a team of people from multiple disciplines. Maybe you have a tax expert, a law expert, an insurance expert, and an investment expert all under one roof, or that have developed some sort of a virtual collaboration where they actually do work together to give you what you're looking for. But this idea that you're going to somehow greatly benefit by spreading everything around, all that's going to happen is you're going to have twice as many meetings and half as much effect in the end. It's not going to be as effective. 
So again, simple and effective. If you can't choose one primary financial planner slash advisor fiduciary to be kind of the quarterback of your various strategies, you need to keep looking. You, you need to keep looking until you find somebody that you trust and is competent and that will be there for you and that follows best practices. If you're curious about how to examine that, I would suggest listening to our episode seven on that, where we provide some of the most important financial planning questions. It's a great way to, I guess, throw a litmus test at your financial advisory team. Next question. All right. Go ahead. What is a PE ratio and what does that tell us? So when I see this question, usually it means somebody's in the weeds a little bit and they're looking at, they're trying to analyze individual stocks. But to answer the question, you know, bottom line up front, PE ratio stands for price divided by earnings. And so you're taking the price per share of a stock, say a $20 stock, and you're dividing it by the annual earnings per share of that stock. So if the earnings per share, the profits per share of that company are $2 per year, and it's a $20 stock, your PE ratio is 20 divided by 2, it's 10. And what they're trying to do with these with this ratio, and there's other ratios. You can take price per share and divide it by cash flow per share, uh, free cash flow, book value. There's lots of things you can divide by. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to find a way to how do I compare a stock that's $20 to a stock that's $150 to a stock that's $1,000 per share? How do I know which one's really on sale, so to speak, or which one's expensive, so to speak? And as long as they're all in the same industry... That's, that those kind of valuation ratios give us an idea of a way of kind of leveling the playing field and comparing those companies that have different prices on their stock. You could have a $20 stock that goes with a company that's actually a bigger company, a bigger business than a, than a, a company that has a $100 stock. The stock price has absolutely nothing to do the price per share has nothing to do with the size of the business that we're talking about. Or the profitability. Or the profitability. So that's the that's the whole point behind this idea of a PE ratio. So when you look at the overall stock market, historically, the ratio, depending on the time frame you're looking at, the, the normal PE ratios of the overall market have historically been somewhere between 15 to 17. Um uh, Generally, when they're super high, that's kind of an indicator that maybe it's not exactly on sale. So in the peak of the 2000 bubble back in the year 2000 with the internet bubble, the S&P 500 had a P.E. ratio of something like 34. So that was very, very high. It made no sense. And in 1982, the P.E. of the overall market was under 10. So it was below average. What happened? Well, if... People bought the stock market in 1982 when a P.E. ratio of the market was under 10. It was very, very low relative to history. They had above average returns for quite a while after that. So if you buy low, better returns. That's the theory. And if you bought high in, say, March of 2000, the market provided virtually zero returns for the next decade. It was not a good deal. So is it a short-term indicator? It is absolutely not. Valuation indicators, P, and PE is not even the mo one that's the most, say, um, predictive. But, and there's others. There's uh, Robert Schiller has one called the CAPE that looks at PEs over a 10-year period and looks at where things are now over, over the last 10 years of earnings. And that one seems to be pretty accurate. Um, John Hussman has one of his own that, that has a very high correlation with future results 12 years from now. But 12 years is a long time. We've discussed that in earlier episodes. Uh, it doesn't tell you anything about the journey in between. PE ratios don't really tell you anything about what might happen in the next month or two months or week or day or six months or a year. But it, it's an indication. If you're a long-term investor, if you're really thinking long-term, like 10, 12 years out, it's an idea of, hey, is, where's the risk here? If you buy something maybe with a lower PE, 
than its normal history, maybe that's a little bit better off. And then that can vary industry to industry. You've got high growth industries like information technology where they'll normally have a higher PE ratio than a lot of the other stocks out there in the market that are more industrial or, or brick and mortar type businesses. That being said, those information technology companies can still be high relative to where they normally are or low relative to where they normally are. But all this set aside, why should an individual even really bother with this level of analysis when the market is so efficient and there's so much research out there that's available from people who are experts on these things? Why even pick stocks in the first place? That's generally not been effective. Even professional managers that pick stocks have had a tough time keeping up with the market returns. So in my view, I'd say Picking stocks from as an individual, as an amateur, or trying to be a trader of stocks as an individual or an amateur, if you've had above average returns for consistently for 5, 10, 15 years through all market cycles, then you start to have a track record as an amateur and you're no longer qualified as an amateur, I guess. But if somebody's out there saying, hey, I've just done so well for the last month or six months when the market's been going basically straight up, That's no indication of your skill as a stock picker. So why even bother? I mean, it goes back to, you know, asking who, not how. You can just buy the market and have a package of the overall stock market or hire a professional who knows how to manage the risk on those things. And we're not talking about financial advisors. We're talking about actual people that just manage money, professional institutional money managers, mutual fund managers, or just buy an ET, an exchange traded fund that's an index. And you're buying the whole market so you don't have to worry about it. But what's the P.E. ratio? I'd say the usefulness of that is to give you an indication of the risk that you're taking over the long run. And then you can take a look at the overall market and use that as a telltale indicator if the market is on sale or if it might be highly more highly priced. Exactly. Next question, Brian. I'm worried about stocks. I need my money to work for me, but interest rates are really low. What should I do? Yeah, here we are in 2020 and we've got interest rates on cash and bonds is about as low as we've ever seen. And I'd even say that you know, by a lot of measures, stocks aren't exactly on sale either. So it creates quite a challenge. And, and really the answer is, when when you're faced with this level of uncertainty and really <laughs> at any time in history investors are looking at a situation if you're looking at the short period of time it's gonna be uncertain because there's no predicting the short term there just is no predicting the short term that's why we have that's why all the investment books and all the investment best practices are all focused on long term goals if you have a short term goal you need to be short term with your tools but what you really need to do is you need to start and put the big rocks first. So if we're talking, put the big rocks in the jar, then the smaller rocks, then the small gravel, and then the sand, and then the water. You've got to prioritize what you're focusing on. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to get it all done of the things that are most important. It's way less stressful if you just put those big rocks first and, and focus on those big priorities. Number one, you need to know yourself. You need to understand your risk tolerance. You need to understand your goals, and you need to understand what you're saving right now. You need to know your current situation and where you want to be. Where are you? Where you want to go? What are these dollars? I'm worried about stocks. I need my money to work for me. What? What's that money? Is it short-term money? Is it long-term money for... Is this person yeah. asking the question? Is this and we don't know? I, th- I think money? I think most people are thinking completely short-term about every single thing as if every single dollar they have is important a month from now or two months from now, or three months from now. My retirement is 35 years away, and so I'm going to stress out over what happens in the next month or two or three or four. Or my life expectancy is 50 years away. That's your true time horizon. Your retirement date is not the finish line. It's the starting line of a different way of looking at your investments. But the finish line is actually when you finally pass away. So I think a lot of people are 
looking at every single dollar they have in their entire net worth as if it's critical what happens in the next three months or the next six months. And the truth is, is that in all, they just don't understand the probabilities. They don't understand how different types of investments work over different time frames. And investments are nothing more than tools. There are tools that are highly effective for stability in the short run. These are things like cash, checking accounts, savings accounts, money market accounts, anything FDIC insured like a CD, a certificate of deposit at a bank. By the way, you can buy CDs from banks all over the country, all inside of One of those brokerage accounts we talked about earlier at a big firm, all the big firms have access to CDs from multiple banks. Guess what? They're FDIC insured too. But those are short-term tools for short-term goals. Stocks, stock mutual funds, stock exchange traded funds, whether it's individual stocks or funds or managed portfolios that are diversified of stocks, anything stock related, you're investing in businesses for, and your reason you're investing in those businesses is to participate in the long-term growth and profitability of those businesses. How will you make money from those stocks? You'll make it from dividends where they share the profits on a regular basis and you get some cash payments. You can reinvest those or pay or you, or put them somewhere else. But also because those businesses invest money back into themselves and they get bigger and more valuable and the price of their stocks go up. But that is absolutely a long-term game. And when we say long-term, we're not kidding. We're talking about 10 years, 20 years or more. If you look and understand the probabilities of how stocks behave, you will see if you study history, the stock market is very, very choppy and unpredictable in periods of time that are shorter than three years. Nobody knows what's going to happen. There will be people at times in history that claim they know or they called it that they predicted X. Those people are never consistent at doing that. They get lucky for a period of time and they write a book and they become famous and they have 15 minutes on the news or whatever, but they're not consistent predictors of anything otherwise they'd be some of the most like they'd be household names but who are the household names when we look at the world of investing it's people like warren buffett or his mentor benjamin graham and what do they tout absolute long-term buy and hold long-term investing when it comes to stocks patience waiting warren buffett's partner charlie munger he says more money is made in the waiting (laughs) than anywhere else. It's a patience game and it's an extraordinarily difficult thing. But if you're looking at your money right now and that you're looking at your retirement account and yes, maybe you need to focus on your risk tolerance, but once you know your risk tolerance, put a portfolio together that matches your risk tolerance and in all probability matches your goals and take some action because the risk you face when you're trying to play this guessing game of, well, what if this happens in three months? What if that happens in three months? I'm going to wait till this one thing happens, or I'm going to wait till the market comes down, or I'm going to wait till the market goes up. or I'm going to wait till I feel good. I'm going to wait till, you know, the sky is a certain color on third Tuesdays of the month. And you start getting all superstitious about stuff and trying to predict and try to find that absolute perfection time to buy into whatever your strategy is. You may be sitting there for a very long time waiting, or you may miss out on some huge gains. And the fact of the matter is, is like that's worse potentially than whatever temporary thing might occur two months from now, three months from now. You have to take action for your future. And if you're investing for the long term and your investments are long term assets that have a high probability of giving you a great return over long periods of time. What do you care what happens in the next week, month, day? If you're that concerned about it, at least take some kind of action. Maybe don't throw the whole lump in right now. Maybe it's a systematic thing where every single month you're moving over the next six months, over the next 12 months, and you're systematically take your pile, divide it by 12 and execute because it does you no good to prioritize if you never execute. It does no good to plan if you don't actually do something about it. Action is what leads to success in everything. And that's focusing on controllables as we've talked about. 
And as a young investor, if this is a young person investing, somebody 20s, 30s, 40s, they may be looking at this for the long run. And if they're worried about the stocks, they may have too much of their personal money tied up in stocks, and that could be leading to them being worried about it because their entire net worth is going up and down. In a situation like that, what can this person control? What can they do? They can focus on their emergency money and make sure that they have a good emergency fund set up. Yeah, this comes down to just thinking things through, taking a breath, take a step away from everything and look around at your situation and really prioritize. If you're that worried about every dime you have, that shows me that you haven't taken the time to really go through the getting started process that we discussed in episode six. If you know you can handle any emergency, you've got your emergency funds handled, then, then you can set all those aside. And if you know you have the proper insurance coverage to cover any other thing that may occur that you can't afford, the big impact, low probability things like permanent disability, premature death, long-term care, your house burns down, your car is destroyed by hail, whatever, fire, if you have all those insurance coverages handled, guess what? You can set all of those worries aside. If you have enough money to last in case you have a job interruption and you lose your job and you have to find a new job and it may take you six months to 12 months to to replace that income, if you have that set aside, you can set that aside and that worry. Because what are you really worried about? If it's your retirement fund, yeah, you might be 50% bonds, 50% stocks because that matches your risk tolerance. But you can't paralyze yourself with worry over something that's completely outside of your control. You have to go. You have to, you can't get anything done without taking a risk. If you get in a car, statistically, it's dangerous. But you get in a car every day, you don't even bat an eye. Why? Because you can't go do your, live your life, at least not in good parts of America, without having transportation. If you live in an inner city, maybe it's public transportation. Maybe you're walking. Maybe you live in an area like that. But guess what? There's still risks there too. You have to get out and live life. And you have to save for your retirement. You have to save for that long run. You have to have something that's going to generate income for you if you are retired. You can't just stick your head in the sand and go 100% to cash or 100% to stocks or 100% to cash. I mean, that's no way to live. If you break things into pieces and set it aside, you can make, it's a lot easier to make these decisions and just get moving forward. Your last comment kind of leads into this next question, Bri. I'm concerned about current events and don't want any risk in my portfolio, but also I'll feel bad if the stock market goes up while I'm on the sidelines. How do I decide what to do? Well, it's similar to the other question, but... The first thing people need to understand is there's always going to be a trade-off between stability and return in the long-term return and stability is a trade-off. If you, and it doesn't matter whether it's long-term growth or long or high income from something that pays some ridiculously high dividend or high interest rate, there's a trade-off. You are giving up stability in price. So if you're watching that price on a day-to-day, month-to-month basis on your statements of that investment, it's going to bounce around more if it has a long-term greater potential. There is a trade-off. What this person's wanting is they're wanting absolute stability, no downside whatsoever, and they're expecting phenomenal returns at the same time. In the current universe which where we live, that doesn't work. That doesn't happen. There is no silver bullet. There is no panacea. That's what everybody would like to have. But what it boils down to is you have to use the right tool for the right job. You need to focus on controllables. You need to, again, you need to understand your risk tolerance very precisely. And you need to measure the risk of your portfolio very precisely so that you can make sure that you all they always match when that happens 
when your portfolio matches your goals and your risk tolerance, more likely than not, you are set up to handle and weather whatever storm may come in the short run. That's what you have to do. If you say, well, I want double digit returns. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to invest in things that have gotten double digit returns for the last one, three, and five years. I can assure you that probably won't work over the long run because those assets that do that typically don't repeat. The best thing doesn't continually stay the best thing. The biggest company 20, 30 years ago is not always the biggest company 10, 20 years from now. It's there, There's going to be a change in leadership in the economy. Past performance is no indicator of future results. It is absolutely not any indicator of future results. And the thing is, I just go back to the last question. If you have short-term needs, put some of your money in short-term tools. If you have long-term needs, put things in long-term tools. If you have medium needs, create a blend that matches that with all probability. What, what we try to do and what most advisors try to do is come up with a mixture, not based on predicting the future, but come up with something that gives people a high probability of success of meet, meeting whatever that goal is. So if it's a five-year goal, you have to take into account the current environment, the current interest rates, the current valuation of the markets in the world, and come up with a blend that gives that person a high probability of meeting that financial goal. If it's retirement, then you have to come up with, there, we have software, we have tools, everybody does who's in our, who, who does what we do for a living. Every fiduciary has this financial planning software, uh, probability analysis software, risk analysis software. Anybody that's worth their chops has this stuff and they focus on it. It's about coming up with a high probability of success. It's not about trying to predict the future. If you are, pre- if you are expecting that a financial advisor or if you're expecting that you're going to be required to know what's going to happen in the stock market two months from now, three months from now, six months from now, a year from now. If you think that's a prerequisite to, to meeting your retirement goals, if you think that's a prerequisite to funding your child's college successfully, you're not studying probability. You're just not aware of what's possible. You don't have to predict anything in order to succeed as long as you're using long-term tools for long-term short-term tools for the short term. Once you understand that, it's, it gets a lot easier. If you have a short-term need, stability, it's CDs, cash, that kind of thing. If you have a long-term goal, more than likely it's going to need to have more stock exposure and bond exposure because those are long-term tools. Just accept the fact that there no one can predict the future in the short run. Accept the fact that no one can predict the future in the short run. Yeah, but for the last decade, blah, blah, blah has always been the leader. No, always is not true. Always is the last 10 years is what you're saying. You need to look further back and further back. You need to study different decades and different environments and different interest rate environments and different economic conditions and all these kind of things. That's what professionals do. You can't just chase whatever just did well the last one, three, five, and 10 years. That is is unlikely to work. I'm not even going to say it won't work. I'm not even going to say it doesn't work. I'm just saying that history has shown that that is highly improbable to work. Like highly, highly, highly improbable. No decade has ever, ever repeated the decade prior. If you study your history, you recognize this and then you go, oh, I guess that's not possible. I guess I have unrealistic expectations. Current events come and go. History's full of current events. Good times, bad times, good announcements, bad announcements, different politics, the other politics on the other side of the aisle. It, the pendulum swings back and forth and back and forth between good and bad over and over and over again. The one constant over time is the global economy tends to grow. This person sounds like they may be paralyzed into action. And we all might feel at times, hey, I don't know what to do. I feel paralyzed. Focusing on controllables having a plan, setting up a plan can help give you some confidence and maybe give this person some confidence and a feeling that they're in control by creating that investment plan, 
setting up a dollar cost averaging strategy to take advantage of this could be a young person uh, the market could be going down they could be using a dollar cost averaging plan to take full advantage of the downswings in market prices and having something like this may give that person that ability to break through this log jam yeah mental you, you've block. gotta you've got to be playing offense it in anything in life it's better to play offense than sit around waiting dr seuss wrote about it in the book oh the places you will go he says the worst place in the world is the waiting place go get after it you got to take some action because if you're in the waiting place you may be kicking yourself. I saw a lot of people who were in the waiting place. They swore that I, I met a guy when I first started. I think it was one of the first customers I had in 1995, early 95, like January 95. And interest rates were at 7%. And he swore up and down. He had anchored to the 1980s. And he swore that the normal interest rates were more like 9, 10, 11. And so he would only invest in a 7% one year CD. Because a year from now, they're going to be 8%. And then they're going to be 12%. Because the way, in his view, the economy was going to go one specific direction. And he was wrong. He was dead wrong. He could have locked in 8 for a very long time. But he didn't want to lock in 8 because he could get 10 later. He was of a prediction mindset. You can't do that. You've got to take action. And set up a plan because you may take one action today only to next week, next month, have to get in that place right. where you're, you're doing it all again. So create a system, be systematic, and then monitor that plan. Yeah, you're playing this game where you're sitting in cash because you think one candidate's going to win the election versus another candidate. And then for, so you're predicting an election. And then furthermore, now you're predicting what the world's going to do based on the results of that election. And you have, you're, and you're only th focusing maybe on just the president, for example, because we're in two, 2020, it's a, or 2020, it's a, um, it's an election year here in the States. Nobody's talking about Congress and that's a lot harder to predict who's going to win, who's going to control the house, who's going to control the Senate. And those are big factors as well. But nonetheless, you, it's not in within your control. If you go to cash and the election happens and then the markets go way up, what are you going to do? Stay in cash until they fall back down again? You may They may never come back. Then what? You've got to have a plan. Like you said, Dan, you've got to focus on taking action and getting something done. And you mitigate those risks that are out there. But if you're trying to eliminate and you're trying to seek for perfection, you're never going to have progress because you're always going to be in this guessing game and that's hell. You do not want to live in the guessing game place, the waiting place. Let me move on to the next one. Okay. I have a good advisor relationship, but I'm considering moving to another part of the country. Should I look for someone local in the new area? Hmm. We've run into this from time to time, sometimes accidentally, sometimes somebody actually asks the question of us. They don't recognize how, how this all works if you have an advisor and there's, there's an, some assumptions sometimes made. You know, if you're thinking that, the, the first question, I would, the first thing I would say is maybe you need to know yourself a little better and make sure that you have a really good relationship with that advisor. If you're questioning the relationship in the first place, then it probably doesn't matter whether you're moving or not. But if you have a great relationship with your advisor and you're really, really pleased, you may just consider asking that advisor if they can work with you when you live in another state because most advisors have the flexibility and, the, and, and sometimes the willingness, often the willingness to maintain licenses in multiple states. It's not that expensive in most cases. There's some exceptions to that rule. But in many cases... Um, it's, it's a little bit of paperwork that the advisor files, sometimes just an email and it's done and they're able to work with you in another state. So, uh, if you have a great relationship, you can absolutely do that. Um, when, you know, we have clients in States all over the country as well, and technology's really made things a lot easier to, 
to handle. And we've all gotten much better in the last eight months at video technology and video conferencing, screen sharing, um, technology developed, providing a speed of execution. So before you might have gone into someone's office and signed a piece of paper and it's handled right then and there, now you can do that with electronic signatures in many, many cases. And you don't really need a, a wet ink on a piece of paper like you used to. Um, with mobile apps and all these kind of things, it just makes the ability to communicate and ha- maintain that great relationship a lot more effective and easier than maybe it was in prior years. But virtually all advisors um, can work in multiple states, so ask that. But if you're questioning whether your relationship's solid or whether you have a good a good advisor or not, again, we'd refer you back to episode seven. And just go through those questions. And if you have an advisor that's really tackling all those questions in episode seven effectively, and then you're able to communicate with them and they can they can show how they're arriving at their conclusions and they can show that you're on track and how you can improve and they're following all the best practices, then maybe that's somebody worth keeping. Next question, Brian. What is better, index funds or ETFs? <laughs> what about actively managed mutual funds? This is kind of a hot yeah, this, this, this one's this one's from Facebook in this in the investing for beginners group and it's a common question actually uh, you know, as a moderator now I see questions that are r- repetitive you know somebody joins the group and they ask the same question they don't realize it's been asked you know 15 20 30 thousand times in 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 prior months and this just boils down to just not really quite understanding how like all this vocabulary. There's a lot of jargon. There's a lot of financial words out there and people easily get confused and they're asking their friends and their friends think they know. So a neighbor will answer the question with authority and the person goes, oh, so that's the way the world works because he knows more than me or she knows more than me. And in fact, uh, it's the blind leading the blind sometimes and everybody gets confused. So we'll try to try to make sense of this. So we're going to break this into, we're going to put big rocks first. Break this into pieces. There are mutual funds, traditional mutual funds, where you buy a, you're buy you buying into a diversified portfolio of stocks and bonds. There's always a manager of a mutual fund. Now, what that mutual manager does can vary. Obviously, there's mutual funds that invest in bonds and stocks and international this and international that or a blend of all of the above. I mean, it's a huge universe, thousands and thousands of mutual funds. In fact, We've had more mutual funds than stocks for for a couple decades now. It's a big world out there. But within the mutual fund universe, a manager can see, can choose to track a, a common index like the Dow Jones Industrial Average or the S and P five hundred is very common, or any number of other indexes. Those are called index mutual funds. If a manager's prospectus says that what they're going to do is seek a specific strategy of stock picking or bond picking or whatever, and they have something where they're not trying to track the overall market, they're not trying to track some index, they have their own strategy that they're running, sometimes that's more passive. There's like there's fun companies out there that buy and hold for a very long time, but they're still considered, quote, active managers. Because- Can you speak briefly about prospectus use the word prospectus yeah so a prospectus is basically the rule book for the mutual fund so they have to publish and say here's what we're doing in this one fund here's the rules here's the here's the lanes and traffic where we're going to stay maybe we're going to invest only in specific things or only in other things or maybe a blend but um, that's the rule book for the fund basically they have to disclose that so you can have a passive index fund mutual fund, and you can have an actively managed mutual fund. And active, the active world is vast because there's a gazillion different strategies, growth managers, there's value managers, there's, you know, growth and reasonable price managers, there's tech technology only managers. It's it's just an endless list of, of different options, but within mutual funds, there's index funds and there's active. Then 25 years or so ago, they came out with this idea of, because mutual funds, the, the, the problem with mutual funds that people were seeing in that product is that when you buy something, a mutual fund or sell the mutual fund, say at noon, 
you get the price of whatever the price was at the end of the trading day. So even if you place a trade at 830 in the morning central time, when the market first opens, you only know, you don't really know what price you're getting. It depends on what happens that day. So you don't have a lot of that in during the middle of the day ability to, to move around and really know what price you're getting. The second thing that happened with mutual funds is that let's say you have one of those active managers and they bought a stock inside their mutual fund 25 years ago. And that stock was say Apple and it has gone meteoric in its rise. It's just done phenomenally well, but now it's 25 years later and they're trying to rebalance their portfolio and they sell some Apple stock in say 2020. Well, the mutual fund has just realized a capital gain inside their fund. Now you may have only bought this fund a week ago, this mutual fund, but they just sold Apple stock and made a huge profit. And now guess what happens? In December, they're going to have to distribute to you your share of their capital gain. And so the, the inefficiency with mutual fund, the mutual fund was that you don't really have control over the tax consequences. You might have a capital gain that you didn't even decide to receive. We've worked with some mutual funds. We've had the unfortunate experience of having a mutual fund that had negative performance for a year. And then at the end of the year, not only did we have negative experience, but now there was this taxable burden that the client had to pay. They had capital gains distributions. Correct. And that may also not have been the manager's fault because if you have a down year, what happens to mutual funds? People sometimes they, it's funny, people say buy low, sell high, but in reality, a lot of people buy high when they feel confident and then they sell low. So a lot of times what will happen is in a down year, people will redeem their shares of their mutual fund. They'll sell shares of the mutual fund and the managers are forced to sell stocks or bonds in the portfolio to provide the cash to the people that need their money back. So sometimes the managers of mutual funds don't even really have the, the control that they'd like to have and it creates tax inefficiencies. So that's mutual funds. Index funds are, can be mutual funds and then also mutual funds, another kind is actively managed mutual funds. So two types of mutual funds. Then along comes an exchange traded fund, ETF. I hear people say EFT, it's ETF, exchange traded fund. What's that mean? Well, it's a fund where it might have 700 stocks in it, 500 stocks in it, 150 bonds in it. it, it you know, Just like a mutual fund, you have a diversified portfolio with a management team. But like the title says, they're traded on the stock exchange alongside individual stocks. So you go, you, your trading system, the way you buy and sell a, an exchange traded fund is nearly identical to the way you would buy an individual stock. What benefits did they get from the exchange traded fund? They got the ability to make trades at any moment of the trading day, knowing what the price is. So this price throughout the trading day, you know what you're paying, you know what you're getting when you place the trade. Along with that come things like the ability to buy and sell options on those funds, which is a much more advanced thing, but that's actually become useful for a lot of portfolio managers because they can, they can buy and sell options on the overall market or any part of the market. Now there's exchange traded funds that cover every, it's just as vast of a list as the mutual fund list. There's a huge variety, but even within the exchange traded fund world, most of them and many of them will be designed to track an index making them an index exchange traded fund. But there are also some that are still actively managed where the management team is not trying to track some index. They're making decisions day to day to day. And they're making changes day to day. And that makes them active. So there's mutual funds and there's exchange traded funds. And then there's index and active in both categories. What is better? It's not, that's not a, 
that's not a good question to ask. I guess that's the wrong question. Well, there anytime somebody says, what's the best? There's no, our, there's no objective way of saying best. You know, if you say, what's the thing that has the best trailing record for the last three years, that's measurable. But is that predicting what's going to do best over the next three years? The, if, if it was that easy, really? If it was that easy, the investing would be a lot simpler than it really is. It's not. Past performance is no indication of future results. I'll say it again. Past performance is no indication of future results. There's just a huge variety. You need just just put the big rocks first and focus on controllables and focus on your plan, your risk tolerance, your goals, your needs, and you can build a portfolio with whatever. Now, if you're, you know, in, in a lot of our portfolios, we use exchange traded funds for a lot of the advantages that those come with. But we also have portfolios where we still use some mutual funds because there's some mutual funds out there that don't have a good comparison in the exchange traded fund world. It's just a matter of understanding what you're doing and what you're buying. They're different tools, different jobs, different tools, different jobs. It's like saying which one's better, a hammer or a screwdriver, which one's the best. It depends on the job. What are you trying to build? What are you trying to do? What problem are you trying to solve? If if tax efficiency is a major thing, then an exchange traded fund may make sense. But then again, it's a big world out there. It's not ETF doesn't mean S and P five hundred. Index fund doesn't mean S and P five hundred. It could mean the Barclays Aggregate Bond Index Fund. It could be. There's lots of indexes out there to choose from, and they're all different. So it it just comes down to. How are you trying to manage risk? How are you trying to uh, look at the probability set and design things? And that's that's where things get a little bit more interesting. But um, index funds are, usually when people say index funds, they're talking about index mutual funds. And ETFs can be active or passive. And, and there's some good all the way around. So you just have to be aware and educate yourself a little bit more. Or you could choose not to and just buy the whole market and call it a day. That's what a lot of people do. But best, there's no best. There's appropriate and inappropriate. There's knowns and unknowns. And I'm sorry, it's a complicated world out there and it's not predictable. That's where everybody goes insane when it comes to investing is they they want it to be so predictable in the short run. And it's not. It's not predictable in the short run can't say that enough. I cannot say that enough. You do not know what's going to happen in the next month or two months or three months or a year. No one knows what's going to happen anytime soon. Stock investing is a long-term game. Even bond investing can be a long-term decision. So if you have long-term goals, use long-term tools. Short-term goals, you need to use short-term tools. Everything else is controllable. Everything else is based on probability analysis and risk management is something that's controllable. We can control risk. We just don't know what the returns are going to be. And no one does. That's the challenge. And if you do it right, it can be exceedingly rewarding in the long run. The long-term returns of the stock market over 20-year periods or more is like inflation plus 7% historically. That's a good return. Inflation plus seven is the average return. We see questions where people are saying, how can I make 20% in the next week? You're gambling. You're gambling. Hey, that thing just did 70% for the last three years. I think I want to buy that. Well, now you want to buy it? It's over. You think that's going to repeat? I'll just tell you, I don't know, but it's highly unlikely. Look at that thing. It's doing so well. It's highly unlikely that it's going to continue. Highly, highly unlikely. Focus on controllables. Focus on controllables. Focus on probability. Focus on controllables. Not prediction. Can't say it enough. What's next? I'm looking at annuities. What are the best types and which companies should I be looking at? Dan, you tackle this one. (laughs) This is your area of, you have more experience here than I do. Well, annuities tend to have a black eye in the industry in general. Many, many, many people don't like annuities. They they have uncomfortable feelings about them and call them very expensive. Uh, but once which it, some can be. Which yes, some can be, and some people 
unfortunately, there could be those salespeople out there who don't sell them appropriately. But once again, annuities are just another tool in the toolbox. And what are some reasons why you might want to use annuities? Well, there's tax deferred growth. There's a fear of outliving your money. You're looking for guaranteed income. You're looking for some sort of market downside protection. Is there something, this is a, an annuity can provide a, a way to help you protect yourself from a market that's going down. And an annuity can be a CD alternative if interest rates are so low and you're looking for interest rate yields. I mean, as you go into that, it, the thing is, is that there's no such thing as a, the word annuity is like saying investment almost or mutual fund. It's a big, wide world out there when it comes to the world of annuities. And w with all those things you were describing, you're describing there's all kinds of varieties of not only annuities, you know, fixed and variable, but also within, within all those, you have all this different variety of uh, optional benefits, whether they're guaranteeing a minimum income or a minimum withdrawal rate for life or a minimum for this period of time or something that rises this much per year benefit or death benefits that are all different shapes and sizes. It's just a bigger world than the world quote annuities. That doesn't really say anything other than talking about it, like saying mutual funds mm -hmm. are mutual funds, good or bad. Well, it depends. Yep. What are the best types of annuities? As this question is asking, it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. As we are big believers in diagnosing and prescribing, you need to take a look at your situation, understand what it is you're looking for, what you're trying to accomplish, and then the solution will fall into your lap when you're doing it correctly. So know yourself, know your goals, know what you're trying to accomplish, and then ask until you understand exactly what's going on with this versus that. And that will determine what the best type of annuity is for your specific situation. And one annuity might be the best for you. It may not be the best for me and my situation. And no annuity might be the answer for you. That's correct. But it's just, what are you trying to accomplish? If you know, um, but also there's, there are some red flags up there. If, if you know, it again, annuities are a tool. They're benign. They're not good or bad or evil or, or, or horrible. They're just tools. And if you understand how to use the tool, like for example, a, a power saw can cut your finger off. Is the power saw evil? No, you just have to know how to use the power saw. You can do it safely. And if you're using it as it's intended to be used, it can be very safe and very useful as a tool. Annuities are no different, but here's some red flags that people can be aware of if you're if you're being, quote, sold an annuity or if someone's discussing an annuity as a potential solution for you, you know, our, our first thing we'd always go back to is did they diagnose first and then prescribe? That's number, that's number one. You want that. That's a good thing if they're doing that. Right. You don't talk, to, uh, you be the red flag, you raise your hand or the red flag comes up, guy calls up and says, Hey, I've got an annuity. I want to sell you. They know nothing about you and your situation. Have I got what you need? But you know, little things to look for is if someone says, hey, you can get 100% of the upside of the mark, of the stock market with none of the downside. That is patently false. I'll say it again. There is no investment. We said this earlier. There's always a trade-off. There is no investment that provides you with 100% of the up moves of the stock market and none of the down moves in the stock market. There is always a trade-off. There's a cost. Someone is oversimplifying in order to get your attention to get you into a sales presentation. And if someone says, I can get you all the market upside with none of the downside, they're lying or they're ignorant or they're just not competent at their job. Move along. Other things. Pay attention to what's called surrender charges and surrender periods. So this is where you might be locked into an annuity contract for a longer period of time than you think. We see this occasionally. It's not common, but you will occasionally see 
a, say, a fixed annuity, has a stated rate for a stated period of time. Maybe they're going to give you a great rate for the next year. And that's better than what you can get at the bank. Maybe better than what you can get at a CD. And you go, hey, that's a great rate. I think I'll sign up for that. We've seen a few times in our careers where there's a horror story and someone has signed up for a contract that's actually a 10-year contract, but the rate is only guaranteed one year at a time. And that would be bad. You sign up, you're getting a great rate for year one. You have no idea what the rate is in year two, and you find out you're in this thing for seven years. And you're stuck. Oh, and if you want out, oh, it's a 7% penalty. Now you're stuck. And then you're really stuck. So ask until you understand. Know what you're getting into, getting yourself into. And if you don't understand, and if someone's not really being patient with you to let you be understand and they're not being fully transparent with all the good, the bad and the ugly that comes from each tool that you're investing in move along. You don't have the right person in front of you. You need to be working with somebody that actually cares more about your success than their own commission. And that's a potential red flag out there. So look for things like teaser rates, or, hey, if you invest in this, we're going to give you an upfront bonus of 5 or 10% right out of the gate. Well, it, they're not just being charitable there. They're locking you into something. There's always a catch. There's always a trade-off. So when it comes to those, but again, you know, they're just tools. They can be valuable. They can be exceedingly useful. Just know what you're doing. And if you're doing it yourself as a, and you're trying to do the research yourself to find an annuity that's best for you. One of the challenging things is, as you look at some of these variable annuities and that have some of these, and index annuities that have some of these benefits and features, they can be very complicated and confusing. And what's even more is each insurance company has their own language, their own jargon to explain the same thing which can become maddening if you're sitting at home and you're comparing two or three different annuities to see which one's best for you. And they're describing each benefit using different terms makes it really difficult to understand. And, uh, in this case, sometimes it may be best to talk with a professional that you trust who really understands and is somebody that you feel confident in asking until you understand. And as you work with some of these annuities, and as if you think one of these annuities may be beneficial for you, or if an advisor is suggesting an annuity like this for your particular situation after they've diagnosed, and this is their prescription to your personal situation, if you don't understand, you've got to ask until you understand. Once You don't want to have buyer's remorse. It's too often that we see people, they've basically mentally gotten exhausted through the whole process, and they just say, okay, you seem like a nice person. I trust you. And that's not good enough. It's just not good enough. You have to understand. Do you need to understand every single thing? Do you need to understand it at the level that you're, that an advisor does? Do you need to understand it at the level that the securities attorney understands it? No, you do not. But you need to at least understand what's good, what the potential bad parts are, how it solves your one of your problems. You at least need to understand how investment strategy will solve a problem for you. What does that do? If you can't explain why you're investing in that strategy or in that annuity or whatever it is, you need to ask at least until you understand now, how does that improve my life? And it's, it has to be more than, well, it's a better rate. That's not good enough. You need to understand what, what's the worst thing that can happen. Yeah. How does this I mean? The biggest question we ask in due diligence, whenever we're look, talking to anybody is how did, when does this blow up? How can this blow up? How can this embarrass me? How as an advisor? And then how can this hurt my client? That's the questions that a good advisor should be asking that we're required to do due diligence. You need to know the worst case scenario. And then you go about figuring out, okay, well, how do I mitigate that risk? Knowing that there's a trade off with everything, nothing's perfect. But you need to at least have an idea of what's the best case, what's the worst case, and how does this fit my particular plan? 
How does this make my life better? Do I re- have I reduced a risk? Have I reduced expenses? Have I reduced taxes? But how does this benefit me? A better rate is not enough information. Keep asking questions. So next question. Yeah. Uh, well, one aspect of this question, let me just move on to what kind of insurance companies should we be looking at? Uh, companies, the financial strength of companies are rated by four top rating agencies, Moody's, AmBest, Standard & Poor's, and Fitch. So these ratings companies, they look at insurance companies across the industry and rate them for financial strength. From there, these these ratings agencies will help you determine which companies are the financially strong and which may not be. And what's the best company that you should be using for, that you should be looking for? Well, unfortunately, it's not simple, Brian. It depends on the annuity that you need. So based on your diagnosis and prescription, diagnose and prescribe, you find out what type of annuity fits the bill for you based on the type of annuity will determine which company or pool of companies are the best for you because certain companies have best are, are best at fixed annuities some have excellent indexed annuities yeah they've chosen where they want to compete so you're going to go to a certain list of companies for one type of annuity another list of companies but generally speaking you want to go with a higher rated company Yes, for quality, because if they're you know when you're buying an annuity, it's an insurance company, it's an insurance contract. You want that insurance to be there. You want them to be, it's a promise, stable, and you want to be able to keep their promises. So the ratings agencies can help with that. Are they are they perfect? No, but you do with what you can. Before we leave the annuities world, I just want to say we've had some folks who were very very fortunate, and they had annuities. Recently, here in 2006, 7, and 8, they had annuities. And we also had, uh, back in the day, other clients with annuities back in 1999, 2000. In both of those times, the annuities really saved their bacon and allowed them to retire comfortably. So these are periods that were immediately followed by long, huge bear markets. And for some people, in some annuities that some of those guarantees really help were, were valuable. So again, it's a tool. It's, it can be valuable. Uh, you just want to make sure that you understand. And is there a cost to it? Yep. yep. It's insurance. Yes. So you have to be aware of that. And you have, and just, just again, we're beating it a dead horse, but it's asking until you understand and make sure it's appropriate for you. Yeah. But you don't want to necessarily dismiss the, every, you know, some of the tools in the toolbox. No, don't because annuities have their place. And folks who say all annuities are bad, that's just not true. And just to be clear, we find it, even in our own diagnosis, that it's not a common thing either. Where I mean, it's not a situation where like every single person has a need for an annuity. That's probably not the case. It's just, it's a unique situation. And we, it's a tool that's out there, and we, we're always aware that that's a tool that's potentially available. Um, is it, but it's certainly not every person needs an annuity. There's people in that camp. There's advisors that are in that camp that say, Hey, you know, everybody needs an annuity An annuity is good for everybody. No, I'm I'll, I'll agree to disagree on that one. For a lot of people, it makes absolutely no sense to have that. And I'm, I'm just trying to, there's a dichotomy here, which, but I'm trying to strike that, that balance of no, it's not right for everybody. And no, it's not horrible for everybody either. Just Diagnose and prescribe. Ask until you understand. I think we beat that dead horse. (laughs) Let me move on to the next question. I'm saving to buy a house in the next five years. What stock, bond, cash mixture would make sense for that goal? Well, first of all, if you're buying a house, this won't directly answer this question right away, but I hope you're buying a house you can easily afford episode five and 14 we covered two books and they in both both sets of research show there's a high correlation of happiness if you're buying a house you can easily afford so don't be stretching to buy a house because they're they're not investments they tend to not make a high rate of return 
don't think your house is going to be a great investment. Just buy the house you can easily afford. But when it comes to saving for that house, saving for that down payment on the house, you got to be thinking in terms of probabilities, not prediction. For shorter periods of time, like we said earlier, you need to prioritize stability over return. I see questions similar to this based on short periods of time, different kinds of short-term goals. One person says I'm getting married in a year. And one person says I've got this coming up in two years or three years. This one's for five years. The answer is always the same. If you can't afford to lose the money and have a significant decline in the money, you have no business investing in the stock market for short-term needs. You need to focus and prioritize stability over the need for return on that money. The reason is you need to buy that house if it's a short-term need. So generally what we would say, the tools one would use for three years or less, we'll typically ladder out things like CDs or high quality bond exchange traded funds that have a fixed maturity date. Those exist where you can buy a an ETF and it's got a pile of bonds inside of it, maybe a hundred bonds inside or 200 bonds in there. And every single bond in there comes due in the same calendar year. So that's a nice tool that's in the toolbox. So you can get a little bit more return, maybe than say a CD or whatever. But if it's a short term need, you got to keep it tight. Prioritize stability over, over the return. If it's 10 years or longer, then you're starting to maybe look at stocks. And if it's between five and 10 years, maybe you're looking at a something in between, maybe a mixture of stocks, bonds, and cash. But generally, I mean, we won't know the exact mixture that's going to be right for this particular person, but don't be thinking that you're that there's like some set answer. You need to do some math. You need to do an actual plan and look at your actual situation. Because unless we, we can do a proper diagnosis or somebody, unless you do a proper diagnosis of your overall situation, you're not going to really know. But it boils down to understanding the probability analysis for that period of time. It also matters what the market's like at the time. Here we are with record, record low interest rates across the board. And it's difficult to see anything that makes a return. So that might change our recommendation compared to if it was like January 1995 and you can get 7% for a one-year CD. It just depends on a lot more than that. So I apologize I can't give somebody a static answer that says, oh, just go, you know. 10% 10% stocks and 8, 90% bonds. I mean, I suppose you could do that. That's fairly low risk portfolio, but you need to know more information in order to really tighten it up. Last question. You ready for it? Bring it. Why would I pay an advisor when I can invest in a target date fund or an index fund on my own? This is a common question. I see it on the internet all the time. It comes up occasionally in conversation with people that are fairly brave and they'll brave enough to say it to our face, but it's a good question and it's a valid question. You know, there's, you know, if you're going to pay any professional for anything, you want to know you're getting to get value and something and something of, of, of value for that fee you're paying. You should get a return on the fee that you're paying. I'll say that again. You should get a return on the fee that you're paying there's a perception that in, that the the only value add that a financial advisor brings is a somehow magically beating market returns and somehow magically getting you a higher yield on your CDs and this is not true the markets provide the return but the advisor should be giving you a good return on the fee that you pay what do i mean by that If you pay someone $1,000, you should get a great return on that $1,000. So what's a great return? You pay somebody $1,000 and they provide $1,000 and plus $200 of value. So maybe they give you $1,200 of value. You paid them a $1,000 fee. Meh. Hey, that's 20% on your fee. If you give somebody $1,000 and they save you $10,000, you just 10 times your money but it's value. If you hire an attorney and you pay them a thousand dollars, do you have a thousand dollars worth of something tangible in your pocket the next day? No, but they've provided a service to you that hopefully added value to you. They maybe 
reduced a risk, made life easier for your family in some way, or maybe uh, put together something that avoided a, uh, an expensive lawsuit down the line. Every service professional should be providing value, and there's no disputing that whatsoever. But let's talk about financial advisors. The first thing I'll say is you may not need a financial advisor. And I would say, especially if all you're looking for is investment management only with no planning whatsoever, you probably should not use a financial advisor. If all you're going to do is buy the S&P 500 and chase things that had a great one year, three year, five year return, and that's already what you're going to do, you don't need an advisor for that. Because yeah, you can go buy an index fund all by yourself. It's very cheap. It's very easy. But I will say this, there have been studies, because other people have this question, it's so common that there's actually been intensive studies done by companies that traditionally one would think is all about do-it-yourself investors. But Vanguard Investments did a study called Vanguard Advisor Alpha. You can Google it. Vanguard Advisor Alpha provided research to seek out where are the value-added factors that advisors bring to bear on investors. And they were focused on saving for retirement and focused solely just on the investing side of things. But even there, what they found is that there is indeed a value of people. What they did is they looked at all the 401k plans that they monitor, and they found that some people appeared to not have advice and they got a certain return and other populations tended to have some advice and they got a better return. So their research showed that there are best practices that can reduce risk, that can reduce taxes, that can reduce expenses and provide uh, behavioral coaching to do the, make the right decision. So you're not buying high and selling low and all those added up and there was a value there. Likewise, there's best practices from a planning standpoint, purely controllable behavioral decisions that people can make during retirement. And Morningstar professionals did a study a few years back. They called Morningstar's Gamma Research Project, and they were focused on did best practices from a planning perspective provide greater retirement income? And they found that indeed, Following specific best practices commonly used by financial advisors did provide up to a 30% greater retirement income. What do I mean by that? What that means is the greater income over the course of their retirement. So there are studies out there that show that if you have a good advisor that's following best practices very precisely, and you're following along with those best practices as a client and doing what is diagnosed for you and prescribed, then over long periods of time, that tends to be better than if, statistically speaking, the odds are in your favor there compared to if you're just doing it all yourself because there are certain things out there that you're just likely to miss if you're doing it on your own. That's been shown. It's not our opinion. That's been proven by Vanguard. It's been shown by Morningstar. And yeah, maybe maybe you have the time and the interest and the expertise and the intellectual desire to learn all of that and then execute all those best practices on your own. And you have a phenomenal level of self-discipline and you can do it yourself. 100%. Go save your money. Do it. That's great. It's not that it's impossible. It's whether or not you want it or not whether or not you feel like you are want to miss out on some of those best practices or whether you're willing to actually go do the work. But this idea that you can just be totally lazy and simplistic and just focus on just buying S&P 500 in a Roth IRA and all your troubles will go away, uh, research has shown that that's not probable. It can earn you some money over a long period of time tax-free if you put all your money in a Roth IRA and do an S&P 500 fund. But does that mean that you're covering all your other bases? If you're wondering what else is out there besides just investing in index funds, um, when it comes to financial planning, if you think financial planning is just investing, um, look up the Certified Financial Planner curriculum online. You'll find that investing is only 10% of that curriculum. That means 90% of the value is coming from things that are, have nothing to do with investing. 
So there's that. And the other thing that, I, that I'd suggest is go look at episode seven of this podcast and look at the most important financial planning decisions and hold yourself accountable to those same questions that you would hold an advisor accountable to. But yeah, you may, you may or may not get value out of that. But the important thing is to just realize one of the strongest leadership characteristics that's been identified, it's now in, it's now just been added to all the military manuals. It's humility. Be humble enough to recognize that you may not know what you don't know. And be humble enough to start asking questions to see if you can expand some and expand your world enough that some of the stuff that you didn't even know you didn't know, at least you find out, oh, I didn't know that. But if you think you know everything, you're probably wrong. Just be humble enough to ask. And yeah, you might be self, you might be like we were talking earlier, you might be completely self-sufficient and be able to do all those best practices all by your lonesome. Good job. You might save a few thousand dollars and you should. But in our experience, I got to say there's still a market out there because there's a lot of people that don't want to, that don't want to do all that. Even people that have the mental horsepower, you know, some of our clients are executives that are very, very astute, very, very capable, very, um, very smart people who understand finance very, very well. But it's not the best use of their time in their mind. So there's a market for it. It's a service like attorneys, like accountants. Can they add value? I think that's unique to your situation. But could they potentially add value? Yeah, I think studies show that there's a good probability there, and that's why we exist. So did you have anything to add on that? Do you value your own time? Uh, You said it. Do I value my own time? Yes. Uh, Someone who does it themselves, someone looking for help, somebody who is a family, they're sitting down, they're trying to figure out their situation, they're selecting investments for themselves. Do they value their own time? If they don't understand numbers and uh, they need to do the research or in order to do a good job, they want to do the research. Do they have the time to do that research? Do they understand what they're reading? How much time is it going to take? And sometimes folks need to make the decision to, if to do it well, you've got to spend s- some significant time doing research. That time can be spent doing other things. Uh, you've got kids and they're growing up and you want to participate in what they're doing. You have a job, you have a business, you're a business owner and you have other uses for your time. Sometimes the delegation is Some, very Yeah, important. sometimes it's delegation for sure. But, you know, the, 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 you know, the answer really is, is that everybody's unique and everybody has their own situation. And there's no right one situation for everybody. But I see, you know, it's, it's maybe it's just the internet, but you all, you, you tend to see on the internet, things are either all, all correct or all wrong in, on any issue. And when it comes to this question, you'll see, I'll see answers like, absolutely not. There's not one advisor in planet earth that even adds any value of any kind for the fee. They're completely a waste of time. They're this broad brush statement. And and then on the other hand, you have sometimes people who will answer as advisors and say, absolutely, you should hire a a financial advisor because they always add value and it's always worthwhile. And there's like, I got to say, there's probably a conflict of interest there. There's not an always or none answer. Like most issues in the world, the true answer is probably very nuanced and very unique to your specific situation. And you have to kind of dive into that a little bit and understand, know yourself and know your situation. And all we're suggesting is, is understand there are people that are good at what they do that can provide a service that does add value. But then it comes down to, are you wanting to delegate that to some trusted group that can do that for you? Or 
Are you in a situation where you're totally fine doing it yourself? It's, it's a choice more than it is an objective fact. It's just a preference. Some people change their own oil on their car. Some people choose not to. Even though they have the capability to do so, they go, I'd rather just not do that. It's just a choice. And that's the great thing about America. We have choices. So you have a choice to hire an advisor or not. The one thing I would say is if you're going to go down that road, there's a big world of people who call themselves financial advisors. And that's why we put out that episode seven. Hold them accountable to those best practices. Look up Vanguard Advisor Alpha. Hold your advisor accountable to those best practices. And then look up Morningstar Gamma. It's Some of it's a little meaty, but put those things in front of your advisor and say, Hey, I read this. Can we talk about these best practices and how you might benefit me and earn, you know, get me some value for the fees that I'm paying? Now, my opinion is they should probably already be doing that. But you can make a difference in your relationship with an advisor if you hold them accountable to best practices that have been proven over time. And they should be doing that. Does that mean you're going to double the return of the S&P 500? No, it's not. No, that's improbable. We're all fishing in the same pond for the same fish. We're probably going to get the same returns over very long periods of time. The trick is, how do you avoid the mistakes? How do you avoid the risks? How do you avoid the excess taxes, excess expenses, and things that create frictions and eat away at that potential of getting a market return? And I think that's where professionals can potentially help if they're following best practices. But I think that's, that's about all I have for this one. Anything else you wanted to touch on? No, I was... I think we... We had some good questions here. We'll keep on saving some, getting some new questions, and uh, hopefully folks will continue to reach out to us and bring us their questions, and we'll cover those in future episodes. Yeah, and in that vein, please let us know if you have questions about any financial planning or, or a topic or investing topic out there. We're happy to help, and uh, we want to cover them on this podcast for you, and we'll do our best to uh, give you an answer that is timeless. And we'll follow those best practices that we've been touting. So thank you again so much for listening to this podcast. If you found value in it, please share the podcast. Please subscribe to the podcast. And uh, just let people know that we exist. We really appreciate you listening. And um, just as as a housekeeping that I forgot on the other end, nothing in this episode or any episode of the Fierce Fiduciary Podcast should be deemed financial advice or or personal investment advice. This is for informational and educational purposes only. You should do your own research or seek out your own uh, properly registered professional for advice that is unique to you. So everybody, thanks again. Until next time. Cue the tiger.